Welcome everyone to today's lunchtime discovery lecture. I am your guest host, Melissa Dowland. I'm the manager of teacher education for the Museum of Natural Sciences here in Raleigh. Um, I am filling Welcome in. Welcome everyone to Oops, today's. Excuse me. Let me turn off that. Um, <laughs> I don't want to hear myself. Um, I am filling in for Chris Smith. It's his birthday today. So if you know him, send him the best wishes. Um, and today um, for our lecture, we are joined by Elisa Rafa, who is a meteorologist for Queen City News in Charlotte. And she also works as a content developer for education programs at Discovery Place in Charlotte. And we are so excited to have her join us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Elisa. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I've seen so many of these lectures roll through, so I'm, I'm so excited to be a part. Great. Well, we're glad to have you. And I should mention to you that this is um, brought to you by the Museum of Natural Sciences, as well as the Office of Environmental Education and Public Affairs from the Department of Environmental Quality here um, in Raleigh. So we are just really thrilled to have you. Um, and I don't know, this weather's been crazy lately. I'm sure you've been talking about it a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a, a special term for, you know, like third winter or whatever we're going through right now. <laughs> I lost track of how many springs we've had. I was actually with some strawberry farmers yesterday covering up the strawberries um, because we've got the multiple nights of freeze. So it was interesting to see those implications. But yeah, man, it's cold out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I hear you. And I, I hope for everyone's sake that those strawberry blossoms don't freeze tonight because I am looking forward to some strawberries, I guess, pretty early this year. Yeah, they looked great. Some of them were so red and ripe already. I kind of wanted to pick some of them and <laughs> give them a try. Um, they're uh, more than a month ahead of schedule. So wow. hopefully the blankets are keeping them warm the last couple of nights. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, it's great to have another um, woman in science here for our Women's History Month uh, series. So if you want to go ahead and get started and share with us about all the amazing stuff you're doing, um, why don't you take it away, Elisa? Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, again, like I said, excited to be here. Let me share my screen, right? That should let me know if I'm doing this wrong. Can you, can everybody see? Can you see? Yep. Looks good. So All there right. you go. <laughs> sometimes technology doesn't want to work out, but it looks like we're good. Um, so yeah, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, as she mentioned, I'm a broadcast meteorologist um, with Queen City News in Fox, Charlotte. And I also kind of side gig and help out with um, science content for Discovery Place Science in Uptown, um, a really wonderful um, local science museum here. So I kind of wanted to start with um, a little bit about me. I am born and raised uh, a New Yorker in the Big Apple, went to the Big Red uh, Cornell University. I got a bachelor's of science in atmospheric science, but a couple of minors in communications and Spanish. Loved my time up in the Finger Lakes. And that picture that you see there is actually me and my brothers. <laughs> and that is us at the top of the Empire State Building. That is my last day in New York before I jet set on this crazy TV career. I had about 48 hours in between graduation and starting my TV career. <laughs> um, and the, the last thing I wanted to do was I wanted to see my gorgeous, most favorite city from the best place possible. So I dragged them to the top of the Empire State <laughs> Building. And I went to Iowa, a New Yorker, wound up in Iowa. My first job was in Sioux City, Iowa, did a lot of work in um, agriculture there, learned so much from so many of our smart farmers um, that really feed us across the country. Um, so I did some work there, and then I got promoted to our sister station in Springfield, Missouri, where I really started to hone in on some of my um, climate communication. In Iowa, uh, one of the cool things that I did was I covered a ton of blizzards, and I love showing this off because some of you might recognize that face. That is Jim Cantori. One of the blizzards that came through was so bad. You know it's bad when Jim is coming through that I got to do my live <laughs> shots right next to him. We we're both broadcasting live in the blizzard and he was able to kind of the goggles that you see me wearing, he taught me how to wear those right and it was really awesome. So lots of great opportunities and some of my work in the Midwest. Um and then I 
came to back home, home ish to the East Coast, right to Charlotte. My first story in Charlotte was they got to send me to Bank of America Stadium, the NFL Stadium, to talk about a weather um, station. I was sitting in the stadium. I was like in my glory. I was like, wow, this is so cool. Back on the East Coast, talking about football and weather. Like, my brothers must think I'm so cool. Like, it was such a great opportunity. My first story live in Charlotte. And I've been here like two years now, right? So now they're like kind of comfortable with me. So <laughs> where did they send me to go shark tagging? <laughs> um, that is me holding a shark. Um, clearly thrilled about it. <laughs> um, it was really awesome. We spent a whole day really out at sea in the open Atlantic um, baiting fish and lines to catch sharks and tag them. And then um, once we tag them, we release them, hoping that another scientist or fisherman or someone will find that tag and we will be able to track their movements. And the story was about how our warming oceans and changing coastline is really impacting um, something that we all, you know, love to look at, talk about. We have a whole week dedicated to, right, um, sharks. So, yeah, so they decided to let me throw back one of the first um, sharks that we caught, and that was my reaction. So grateful, such an awesome lifetime opportunity. Um, grateful the station let me go, and, and for the scientists, that kind of really showed me around. So that's kind of my career in a nutshell. I do a lot of work in um, climate change communication. What really helped get me started was the Climate Matters program. Now, this is a program that started in 2010 with Jim Gandy as their kind of first um, meteorologist that really was kind of the test guinea pig for a program like this in Columbia, South Carolina. And it has since grown to almost a thousand weather casters and a th almost a thousand journalists as well, kind of newsroom journalists that have climate and environment as their beat. Well, what is the program? What they do is they help us with um, graphics and um, science topics, story ideas um, that have everything to do with extreme weather, climate science, climate solutions. And we get these kind of media friendly um, graphics. Now, Climate Matters is a climate central program and they are nonpartisan, nonprofit, non-advocacy, all rooted in science, funded by some government organizations like NOAA, the National Weather Service. The American Meteorological Society, so really just rooted in the science of climate change. And what we get in these kind of media packages are what I like to call TV sexy or TV friendly graphics. A lot of this is data that I might look at because I'm a geek, um, but some of that data is not really public TV friendly, right? It's not easy and appealing on the eyes. So they help us with that you know, making things look, again, have nicer titles, easier to understand, right? So here's an example about a kind of hard science one about less extreme cold in Asheville over winter, which we've definitely had that this year. Some of it is applied um, trends like increasing cooling in the summer, right? Summer's getting hotter. You have an increased cooling demand for Charlotte. So something like that. They do some fun ones. St. Patrick's Day is coming up. Um, they did a really fun one about craft breweries and some of you know how much they've grown and how the economics really matter um, when it comes to water quality, renewable energy. You know, it's a, an environment story when you're talking about your beer. <laughs> Mosquito days in the summer, we all know those are getting longer too as it gets hotter and more humid. This one I've used a lot, allergy season and the growing season getting longer. I was with strawberry farmers yesterday and we saw it with our own eyes, things budding a month ahead of schedule because it's been so warm. And again, a lot of these graphics coming straight from NOAA and the National um, Centers for Environmental Information, government graphics essentially that are made to look a little bit, again, more appealing, a little bit more TV friendly. Um, this one, again, they're kind of replicated graphics from um, NOAA and the National Weather Service. So super easy program that makes it very tangible for us as broadcasters that might have limited time in preparation and on TV. So I wanted in. I signed up for the program before I even had a job in TV. This is how excited I was to talk about climate change on the air. Um, so I used my job in Iowa to kind of get my feet wet in the broadcast industry. And then I wanted in on talking about climate change. So I got this new shiny job in this brand new city and I want to talk about climate change. This is where I got 
my job. This is where I was living at the time. Uh, in Springfield, Missouri, that yellow box is kind of what we call the viewing area. Those, that's where my audience was. The extreme southwest corner of Missouri and northwest Arkansas. And at the time I was there, it was 2016. So we were fresh off of um, the election um, that President Trump won. And these are the election results from that, just to show that I was a little bit worried about pushback because it's a pretty red conservative part of the country, right? So I was worried about political pushback. Like, how can I talk about climate change, especially with that kind of divisive election year that we have just had? But I had an awesome news director that said, nope, these are the stories that we should be talking about. So I want you to do a story. So um, some of the characters that I had in one of my first pieces that I went on the air with in Missouri um, was Dr. Art Digitano, a super intelligent um, climate scientist at Cornell University. Um, so I talked to him about increases in heavy rain and warming temperatures and some of the climate science. The other character was Dr. David Perkins. He's done some work on public opinion surveys on kind of how we perceive climate change as a political topic, as a social science topic. Um, he was kind of the public opinion side of things. But while both were incredible, neither were the star of the show. The star of the show was a brewery, um, a local brewery in Missouri, a uh, cold mother's brewing. If anybody is um, watching from Missouri, you definitely know them. They had some problems with late freezes, um, almost kind of similar to what we've got going on right now. Uh, late freezes, algae growing in their water sources, heavy downpours, destructive hail, extreme weather, and warming seasons were really impacting their beer. They had a beer that they usually use peaches and it was a seasonal beer. And um, the peaches were damaged in a warm winter and then a frost. So it was very interesting to talk to a brewer about climate change, right? Of course, you talk to a climate scientist about climate change, but this is a, a, a brewer that was talking to me about weather and climate. So the story airs and I'm, you know, a little bit nervous, kind of waiting to see the audience response. My news director did say he got a lot of phone calls and we were worried that we were wondering if it might be people that were angry, but it actually was people intrigued going, wow, I didn't know climate change had anything to do with my beer. They were very intrigued. So this is kind of where some screenshots of the story posting on social media from the station website. And you can see some of the comments. There's a couple more of them and just really came in with a ton of support. Watched it with pride. Um, let's see. Very proud of you. Nice work. Like all very positive, supportive comments about this story. Um, this one I, I love. Uh, Proud of you that you're using your platform to speak the truth and educate concerning this hugely threatening and disregarded topic. The audience that you're speaking to needs your bipartisan, incredible voice to see the reality of climate change. And you did an amazing job bridging that with fear, right? I couldn't believe the outpouring. Okay, well, there's always one, right? There's always going to be one. Did get an email that says, short and sweet, <laughs> ma'am, you're completely wrong. You need to take the blinders off, right? So there's always one. But overall, in general, my Climate Matters post or my climate change post on social media really get little to no feedback. There's not a ton in the comments. In fact, as a woman in the broadcast industry, I get many more comments about my looks than I do any material, forecast or climate, any science material. So here's some examples of that. Hmm. Some side by sides. This is a post about um, a study that showed that Hurricane Harvey was kind of juiced up a little bit more, had more moisture because of climate change, because we're warmer, can hold more moisture. So I posted the study and some graphics kind of explaining it. Crickets in the comments. <laughs> there is a post with, you know, just a regular forecast. Looks like temperatures are cold that day in the comments. Elisa, you look beautiful and stunning today in your red dress. No questions about the forecast at all. This is a, um, again, another Climate Matters post about snow declining. No comments. So another forecast thing. At least if you look beautiful today, beautiful and stunning today. Again, more comments about my looks. No one really asking me about the forecast. <laughs> um, winter is warming. Crickets again. Another forecast one. You are beautiful in blue today. 
So being a woman in TV, this happens, right? I get more, more comments than not about what lipstick I'm wearing. Does my hair look like? What am I, what am I wearing? What, what dress am I wearing? Um, this one I was particularly upset about. It was uh, a tweet about ocean acidification. And um, someone says, if you're on here, who's making sandwiches? And then he replies, it was a joke because I didn't think it was funny. Um, I probably understand Doppler radar better than you. Requirements for my job aren't based on my looks, though. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, maybe a misconception just because I'm on TV, maybe wear lipstick and high heels doesn't mean I don't have a science degree and I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and I'm very passionate about that. That's why I'm passionate about doing this science journalism. So while comments like this aren't every day, it happens. And, and I do think it happens more to women in the industry than men. Also, when I do get my negative comments, it's really surrounded by misinformation. Um, here, again, this is a climate.gov um, website about snowstorms and global warming. And the comment says... Aren't they the ones that constantly play with numbers and manipulate their findings? At least a wrap up, still butthurt and butt blasted about Trump winning the election. So again, just conspiracy theories, who's playing with numbers, misinformation, some other negative comments um, or critical comments, I should say. Climate change is the natural changes, stuff we have no control over, um, and that these have been uh, inflated because of and not because of science, but because of politics. This one I highlighted because I like it. This guy is actually a geologist that was a viewer in the area saying that the evidence um, that climate change is man-made is no longer in doubt, talking about some of the evidence he sees from his geology work. Um, again, another post about cold temperatures and then some claims about an ice age. Are all of you global warming cultists going to fall for that too? Um, again, some mis misinformation. And I noticed that when I did get these misinformation kind of conspiracy theory um, comments, it was often always surrounding cold weather or global temperatures. So I learned that the public doesn't really understand the difference between weather and climate. And it's can't really wrap our heads around the big our big picture, right? Just because it's cold in my backyard doesn't mean that the entire planet isn't warming. Also, when you talk about that the globe is one degree warmer than average, sounds really minute, but scientists know that that number on an average is need to look at it a little bit differently. It's weighed a little bit differently than today it's 70 degrees and tomorrow 71 degrees, a little bit different. So that's where I had some communication challenges and that's where I found the, the pushback. So my secret sauce to getting past some of that is by putting a face to the line graph, right? So here's an example of one of those similar line graphs I showed you earlier. To me as a scientist, makes sense. Clicks right away. For us coming later, you know, I got that. But not everyone um, has that science brain, right? And it might be even more interesting to kind of apply it to something that they can understand and relate to better, like beer, right? People can maybe relate to, oh, the favorite peach beer I was waiting for, it's going to be maybe not as good this year or more expensive because the peach for us was mistimed. So I started to really try to put faces to all my wine graphs, find people in the community to talk about these climate stories. And I found a lot of faces um, between my work in Missouri and in Charlotte. Here's just a list of some things that I could remember off the top of my head of stories that I've done. Cattle farmers, chocolatiers, coffee shops. The hardware stores was a fun one. I did a story about how they don't sell shovels anymore because it doesn't snow. Lake tourism, the fall color in the Carolinas getting miscued. Wine was another fun one. Um, Christmas tree farmers. You saw the shark researchers, um, hurricane survivors as well. EV, owner, EV owners and energy sector. So again, found a lot of faces, have been able to really um, garner really nice relationships with local businesses, climate offices, government offices, even community members. Um, the one you see there at the bottom is a community member that's an EV owner that is pushing to get EV chargers in lower income communities as well. So it's been a really awesome ride. I love learning about everything. And what I've learned in doing that is people are also learning with me and they want more. 
They notice my expertise and they also want more. Um, I'm pleased I'm reading some of the comments. I'm pleased to see someone address the reality of climate change. Hallelujah. I love truth and science. <laughs> some more comments. Thank you for reporting this. It gives me hope that I'm seeing this information um, because we are collectively concerned. Wonderful, informative video on such an important topic. Um, I saw last night's broadcast, such a great piece. It's harsh to see, but the public must know your public education is, is a service. So really just overwhelmed with some, again, really positive comments. Now, science tells us this is true. We do know that people care and they want more information. Um, this is a study that was in the American Meteorological um, Society's bulletin, their journal bulletin. You see there, John Morales, he is a legacy chief in um, Miami. Tammy Sousa has done most of her work in Chicago and Philly. And they kind of use their broadcast to survey people to understand that Meteorologists are the most trusted scientists that people know. They're the scientists that we they see every day. We, they come to us for their forecast. So they have this ease in understanding climate change when we're presenting it. Um, this is another peer-reviewed um, published article that I'm actually a co-author of with Dr. Brian Calpano talking about local TV's greatest strengths. And what we did with this is we kind of anecdotally knew from my experience, okay, people aren't really coming at me, so they must kind of care about climate change. Is it because of the way I'm framing the stories to kind of click with viewers with these local faces, right? We kind of had an idea that that might be playing into it, but we wanted to prove it with science. So Dr. Calpano, he's a uh, political science and journalism professor at the University of Cincinnati, and he used the language from a story that I did about vultures the gist of the story was that vultures this vulture is responding to warming temperatures moving farther north because it's getting warmer and the reason why it's a problem is because they have this really bad habit of picking at and killing young cattle um so now this is a newly introduced problem for cattle farmers because now they have this new predator essentially so this is a story that made it on the air in Missouri and Dr. Calfano basically took wording and images from my story and played with different versions of it and ran a public participant survey and in the survey we had one um version of the story, for lack of a better word, um, that was strong human interest, talked about the ranchers' challenge in protecting the calves, talked about the vultures, the warming temperatures, the whole nine yards, essentially what I wound up putting on the air. Then we kind of took some of the details out, had a weak human interest story, one that really didn't mention uh, the effects on the calves at all. And then we had some that included that it was because of the temperatures changing and others that did not, right? So we had basically four different versions of the story um, to kind of see what people were actually responding to. And to no surprise, the strong human interest story that included the temperature trend elicited the most concern for climate change. The weak human interest story also elicited concern. It was just a little bit less. Uh, they were concerned, but not as much. Um, so it basically highlighted the importance of covering local climate stories on, on broadcast TV and kind of highlighted that, that, yes, they are effective communication and education. And I love this line in the paper. It says what these findings suggest is that discussing individual level impacts from climate change featuring the human interest aspect of the story is a critical part of the human influence me mechanism in local TV news. So the stories that we're doing do count. People are listening and people do become more concerned when they learn what's going on. So this was some of the lessons learned. The local stories, the local faces are key. I do often av avoid buzzwords that kind of strike a political nerve, like anthropogenic global warming, um, because people don't want to be blamed, blamed for the problem, but they are supportive of solutions. And science tells us this, too. I'm going to back everything up with science. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a survey done by Yale. They have a really awesome climate change communications program. Again, picking a divisive year of 2020, they were asked, do you think global warming is happening? And notice it's county by county across the country, 72% of adults think global warming is happening. And what I love about showing this map is this time of, you know, this election cycle year, we're used to looking at the electoral college maps, right? Red states, blue states. 
I can't tell which states are red and which states are blue by looking at this, right? It was across the board, even across the political spectrum. Then you ask them, who do you support funding research into renewable energy? And even more say, yes, 86%. Look how much the colors got even deeper. Even more people support research. Okay, so climate change is a problem. It's happening. Most people think that. We, we support solutions like renewable energy. Okay, most people su- talk about, most people support that too. But then you ask them, are you talking about it? And the answer overwhelmingly is no. 35% across the board, nobody's talking about it. Do you discuss it at least occasionally? And the answer is no. So we're concerned about a problem. We support the solution, yet nobody is talking about it. So where does that get us, right? Um, so that's why I think that the the stories that I'm doing on air are so important because they are talking about the problem, right? Talking about the solution, just getting anyone to talk about it. But why do we only have to talk about it with adults, right? Conversation is key. Knowledge and education is key. But kids can be involved in this conversation as well. So broadcast meteorologists often do school visits. That's pretty common. And I took it a step further and went into science museum. So I started doing this um, when I was in Missouri. Um, that's the Discovery Center in Springfield. This is me and a bunch of the kiddos. I had just did a lecture about weather balloons, teaching them about temperature and pressure and moisture. Everything changes in the atmosphere and how we measure that using balloons. We're holding the balloon and the orange that you see is the parachute that's attached to the balloon. Okay, so how did I start doing this? I had always kind of been involved with the museum volunteering and doing um, events and things like that. But this was really a pandemic crisis that turned into an education passion. When the pandemic first hit, like in the scary first few weeks of March 2020, right, and everything closed. When the schools closed, think about it, the nurses, the doctors, the firefighters, the first responders, right, everyone still needed to work. So what do they do without childcare when everything else closed? So the museum decided to open up as a childcare center and to think now about what we did, knowing what we didn't know at the time, didn't know what the virus was, how it spread. Um, We had everyone masked in small groups of 10, separated in different rooms. Bleach was everywhere, wiping things down (laughs) to keep kids separated, but educated and entertained and engaged. And I became their science teacher, their virtual science teacher. That's me teaching them about lightning in the museum. (laughs) So I spent so many afternoons and weekends really keeping these kiddos engaged, educated, and always entertained with science. This is me. I took them outside for some fresh air and decided to put Mentos in um, Diet Coke, which if you haven't done it yet, please do. It's a lot of fun. Um, And of course, gave them a lesson about pressure changes and chemical reactions. And they loved it. We tested it with Sprite, with Coke, and with Diet Coke. Spoiler alert, Diet Coke gets it to go up the farthest. (laughs) So for these science lessons, I basically, we needed to teach them science every day to keep them engaged when they weren't in school. Um, So I, we had a team that was creating countless lessons in every crack and corner of science. And I actually had a hand in helping to create some of these lessons. And I decided to teach the kids about coral bleaching, how our warming oceans and and carbon sinking into the oceans are impacting our shells, snow decline, changes in bird migration. I had them looking at Audubon Society data about how the ranges in birds are changing because of warming temperatures. Um, So you see me doing the coral lesson there, and that's also me doing the renewable energy lesson Um, We made solar ovens out of pizza boxes um, to teach them about renewable energy, did weather forecasting, plant anatomy. I had a worksheet. We looked at tree rings and counted the rings and how fat and skinny they were to talk about how climate might have changed in the past and what can that tell us about the future. So we got creative. We did it all on Facebook Live, but it was such a learning experience and so much fun. Thought it would be funny to include this. One of their favorite lessons was called Grossology. It was the science of poop and farts. Really comical (laughs) biology lesson, but so engaging. They loved it. They wanted me to do it over and over and over again. It was, but again, it was just so fun and rewarding to kind of be able to engage with the kids on this level. So now I'm doing even more of it in Charlotte. I, once I, my time at the TV station in Missouri ended and I moved to Charlotte, 
I wanted to continue doing the museum work that I was doing. It really, at the time, filled a passion that I didn't know I was missing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm staffed on um, Discovery Place Science in Uptown, and I'm on a content team of, we're multiple scientists, all with um, at least bachelor degrees in science, and we're creating content in every crack and corner of science. There's a physics specialist, a computer science specialist, a natural science specialist, STEM design, right? And I handle a lot of the weather, climate, environment stuff. Um, some of the things that I've done there are um, summer camps. Um, one of my first assignments was to keep kids occupied in a summer camp for a week long. And I did three weeks of content. And I kept them occupied with meteorology. And we did a weather camp. I did two ocean camps as well, teaching them about oceanography. Um, a lot of digital content as well. Um, you can see me there. These are screenshots from their Twitter page. I did a lesson on um, making snow and snow decline and testing out how you can make snow, a heavy wet snow and a dry snow using household items like baking soda, water, <laughs> things like that. And that's me um, sacrificing my hairdo for a static electricity um, lesson. That was a lot of fun as well. So again, engaging videos that um, the kids can watch at home. Now, we also have some hands-on lab, lab spaces in the museum. Now, these hands-on lab spaces, um, that science team that I'm on, we're generating the content for those lab spaces. And I still can't believe they let me, but somehow they let me generate a lab exhibit that was in this museum for a whole summer. And it was part of the Unseen Oceans um, traveling exhibit, Discovery Place Science. If you've been there, you know that they have a lot of um, traveling exhibits that come through every quarter or two or so. And over the summer, we had this Unseen Oceans exhibit that was everything we know and don't know about the ocean. I mean, some say scientists say the ocean is less explored than space. Um, you know, so some creatures that we might not know about, maybe some climate impacts. There's a really beautiful exhibit that's a picture of some glow in the dark fish um, that were in there and me in the submarine. So for the lab exhibit, I was able to pick my topic and I decided to go with our footprint under the sea, how climate change and pollution are impacting our oceans. So here's a look at that lab exhibit that I did for, this was in Discovery Place Science in Uptown um, last summer while the oceans exhibit was going on. I had four tables to fill. So I needed four hands-on activities for these kiddos in in um, in this topic. And honestly, not even kids too. We do um, tailor a lot of our content even to adults as well. So one of the tables was talking trash, more plastic than fish. How, uh, and basically I took risk recyclable and non-recyclable garbage. And we kind of labeled how long it took for these things to biodegrade, which shockingly, or maybe not shockingly, a lot of these things either take hundreds of years or never biodegrade. Um, and then the kids had to kind of, it was like a sorting game. Okay, is it recyclable or not? Um, where Which trash can are you throwing it into? And it always shocked people that the um, single-use plastic spoons and forks are not recyclable. So it's a really good lesson in reusables, right? Like, why do we need to keep throwing out this plastic fork that is going to wind up in the ocean? Studies show this. Um, let's just use some washable ones. You could take them to work in school. Another table was on ocean acidification, impacts on our seashells. So we had some seashells um, at our disposal. We have a really awesome kind of a living creatures, living um, aquarium team. And so they were able to loan me some shells that I dunked in vinegar so they could see the um, process of that acid kind of breaking down the material that the shells are made out of. I don't know if you could tell, but some of them had holes in them when were brittle and the kids were able to kind of feel the difference, which ones were weak, which one had holes. And then in that book, they were writing down their observations like any true scientist would um, to kind of learn about these impacts. Manatee mortality was a game that we created to teach um, everyone how you can help save a sea cow. So if you're unfamiliar, manatees are endangered and it is by far and large because of human action. Um, they either get struck by boats or a big problem is our pollution gets into the water, creates um, algae blooms that suffocate their food. They eat grass like a cow. <laughs> That's why they call it sea cows. And then and then they lose, they essentially starve because their food is kind of killed by our pollution. 
So this game um, is a little bit of a matching game and you pull a card and it's either a green card and the card would say something like um, some, some laws are passed today where there's a speed limit that was brought down in your waters. So there's going to be less boats coming through. You win happy manatee. You had a good day. And then there were some red cards that said like, oh no, someone decided to fertilize their lawn right before it rained. Fertilizer got into your water. Now you lost some of your lunch. So, and then it was, and then you put it on the red spot. And then whoever got to a green happy manatee first would win. And the kids suspense seeing them with this card game, man. They're like, oh, it's going to be red or is it going to be green? And, and they actually, I was worried they wouldn't want to read the card. They were reading it. I was like, learn why. And they were engaged and excited to kind of get through this game. Um, this one um, was also fun. Our oceans grow for modeling sea level rise. I built that model. Um, just sitting at home one night with a little blue gun. And this point of this one was to teach kids about sea level rise and how our warming oceans are literally getting taller through thermal expansion, melting glaciers, um, a couple of reasons why our oceans are getting taller. And they're getting taller pretty drastically. Um, and so I built this model and the point of the fan was so they could kind of slosh around and create storm surge and waves and wave action to kind of see, well, okay, added more water. It's kind of sitting on a, a heating pad. So we're heating the ocean, adding more water. And then the idea is the ocean is taller, storm surge gets farther inland and can be more destructive. So we let them kind of splash around with that fan to kind of talk about that. So what I learned in doing this is kids care too. The science is attainable for kids. It's not over their head. They understand it. They see it with their own eyes they see it they're it's they're they're seeing it too um a lot of them even understood and knew the concepts coming into the exhibit they were smart and intrigued and it was so fun and so exciting to kind of get to engage with them in that way and learn with them and um like i said they were smart they were excited about it and they they know and see this stuff is happening too so it's so rewarding i truly love and have a passion for educating anyone of any age, anyone that will listen to me, kids, adults, about climate and environment issues, because they truly believe that um, it's the first step to a cleaner and more resilient future. If, like I said, if we're not, if we don't know about the problem, you can't talk about solutions. If you're not talking about the problem, there's no way that we can talk about solutions. So that is why I am passionate about that first step of talking and educating, getting it on the air, um, with some of my local stories that I do, getting it in museums and it, having it be attainable for kids because that is the first step to talking about solutions. And we do need solutions um, going forward um, as this crisis continues to unfold. And I do feel like it's my way to help contribute to a healthier future, right? This is kind of my way to do my job and kind of helping forge a path to a healthier, cleaner future. Um, as we talk about these solutions. So thank you so much for having me. I know we've got plenty of time for questions. I'm an open book. I'll answer whatever you've got. Um, but yeah, and reach out to me on social media, Facebook, um, Twitter. That's my email with the TV station. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, that's okay. wonderful. Thank you so much, Elisa. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, leave that up for a second. And then if you want to stop sharing your screen and we can do some questions, but in case sure. anybody's writing down your contact information, I'll just leave that up for a minute or so while we get started. But um, just first of all, there's been a whole bunch of comments in the chat about how inspiring you are and how wonderful the work that you are doing is. Um, specifically, there was a love the manatee activity. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and as you know, as a science educator here at the museum, you know, with a science background doing education, like I just, it's heartwarming and wonderful just to hear you addressing what is a challenging topic and bringing that to life for so many people. Um, I just um, really uh, am inspired and respect um, what you're doing in your job. It's amazing to hear about it. So thank, thank you. you. That. Yeah, that was challenging for me with that specific because I it was I thought it was an important topic. I wanted to do something about an, an animal being impacted by our actions, but I was like, well, I don't want to like bum the kids out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> talking about manatees dying off. So it was challenging to kind of find an approach that would be engaging and but still you know 
educational and it, it worked. They really enjoyed that game. Um, but awesome. yeah, no, th- thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, why not, why don't you stop sharing your screen now sure. so they can see, see your face a little bit bigger, but, um, but yeah, so, so many of the comments are just really inspiring. And then there are a few questions popping up in here as well. And um, everyone should feel free if you have additional questions to put them in the chat um, and we will try to get them to them if we have time. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I feel like maybe we should start with the lightest one though that just came in. What's the most embarrassing thing you've done on air? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So actually I've gone viral multiple times for news bleeper, a uh, blooper. It wound up in the, um, what do I want to call it? Like the real, they do like reels of like, these are all the hottest news bloopers of the month, of the year, of the decade of, you know, and I wound up in every single one of them for <laughs> this chat that I did with my co-anchor, um, who is now currently my fiance. So I guess we, we uh, did have some chemistry at the desk, but we <laughs> um, were chatting about, um, Chipotle bowls, how they had like a new bowl for like the new year, or some new like paleo bowl. And it, we were just kind of missing each other because I thought he was talking about like taco bowls that you can eat. And it's just a really funny conversation because we're clearly just like missing each other. And we just like burst out into laughing because we're just not understanding each other going back and forth and um, just burst out into laughing that I actually still, this happened years ago. It was like, 2018 2019 and i still get comments on my youtube page on this video like people still comment on it i can still get notifications of people commenting on it oh man that is that is funny and uh but also kind of tough you know it's like i guess i guess that's the the downside to being a media personality right things stick with you but i i it takes me back to what you're saying early on about being a woman in this field and some of the challenges that you face um, and and just the the type of feedback you get um, about your appearance rather than about your science. Um, And I just really appreciated you sharing that because I feel like that's a struggle that so many women have. Um, And it's a good reminder that like you, you are a scientist first and look at all of the amazing information you are aware of and you are able to convey to people so clearly. So yeah i wanted to thank you for that yeah of course no i'm I'm a scientist and i'm also a person some comments can be a little mean mm-hmm. um and i think with the age of social media and digital mm-hmm. it's easy to kind of come behind a wall and not feel like you have responsibility for saying those things because it mm-hmm. i always wonder like would someone say that to my face this dress is ugly or you look bad or you look this and you know and it's just so much easier to be a keyboard warrior these days um and by far and large i it happens i mean men get comments too but it happens to women much more i mean even an, an example um like i said i'm me and my fiance were co-workers and we both posted a picture of, of donuts, right? We had donuts in the newsroom that day. I'll never forget this because I'm so mad. We both <laughs> posted the same exact picture of the donuts. Joe's comments were, oh, those donuts look delicious. Have a great Friday. My comments were, be careful, Lisa. A moment on your lips, a lifetime on your hips. Don't eat too many donuts. I was like, what? If I, it was, you know, so it, yeah. it, ha- it happens and it is a challenge for women in the industry. Um, but... I think the more that I do these stories, the more that um, I think people kind of appreciate the science that I can also bring to the Mm -hmm. table. Yeah. And they wonder, so one another question that came up was, um, how do you handle criticism from climate change deniers? And I almost wonder if dealing with that sort of criticism of your appearance and that whole kind of like overcoming that kind of barrier of like you just end up in a different place as your woman has helped you a- be able to communicate in that way so I, I you know maybe not I'll let you answer that question but how, yeah. how do you deal with that kind of criticism the personal criticism you definitely develop some thick skin over and kind of learn you know mm-hmm. what maybe this person just had a bad day and I'm, they turn on the tv I'm the first one they see so they're like oh I hate her dress you know and you <laughs> just kind of learn to like hmm take it with a great you know don't let it bother you i usually kind of kill them with kindness yeah. like i'm sorry you don't like my dress i right. hope you have a better day you know like 
Yeah. And I think yeah. Kelly was asking more more also about like the climate change denial yeah. criticism that you might get. Do you how do, how do you handle that? Because that is that is a tough, those are sometimes very tough questions to to handle gracefully. Sometimes, so I always when it's misinformation, I always try to kind of like steer them back to, well, this is the evidence that this is the evidence that we have, right? This is why we know what you're saying is not true. Um, and you do that a, a couple of times. And sometimes I actually do get a response from people that are like, oh, I didn't know that. Thank you for sharing. Like, thank you for teaching me that. So it's not all like mm -hmm. negative doom and gloom. Sometimes people are curious and just at like, kind of just asking and then don't realize. And then it's kind of more of like an educational conversation. Mm -hmm. The ones though that keep just like hitting with the extreme denialism and the extreme conspiracy theories or the extreme like political commentary, mm -hmm. you're almost like that percentage of people surveys show is so small. There's mm -hmm. a, a study that's called the six, um, six Americas. And it shows that that sector of the extreme denialism is a very small fraction but it happens to be the loudest so it mm -hmm. seems like it's a lot of people but it's it's really not mm -hmm. um so I, I try to educate people as much as i can but if i still keep getting these combative answers at some point it's not i'm not going to change his mind nothing i say nothing i do nothing i show is going to change this person's mind so uh, i don't want to say you wave a white flag but you just hope that the more work i do the more it kind of drills in. I think over time, people people are smart. They see the patterns and the stories that I'm telling. Even if I don't say climate change caused the strawberries to bloom early, you're kind of hearing the same story over and over again about how winter was warm. It didn't snow. Like things start to click, I think, in, in pattern recognition. So yeah, sometimes it's an educational um, journey. Sometimes it's not. And that's okay. You can't beat yourself up over that. Yeah. And I'm sure your thick skin helps in dealing with that. Mm -hmm. But also, I love the way that you talked about bringing in local stories to make it relatable to people. And I think that that is a fantastic strategy. Um, and it's neat to see that you've even got that scientific data backing up the impact of that kind of work now. So that's amazing. Um, another question that kind of relates to that is, um, how do you how do you simplify those graphics without, you know, like, d you know, use the phrase I don't think you used it, but people use the phrase dumbing it down, but you don't want to dumb it to the point where you're insulting your viewers. So do you, how, do, how does that work for you to be able to take complicated information and just like distill it into what's really kind of in, in digestible to the, the public that's, that's watching or the kids that you're working with? Yeah, that's a great question. And while that's, it's challenging as a whole, it's even more challenging on TV because I have a very finite amount of time mm -hmm. to work with. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an hour to explain things. Um, an average TV story is a minute, 30 seconds. I do a lot of kind of deep dive stories. So my stories usually wind up being probably four, five, six, you know, even closer to 10 minutes, some of them. So I still get a little bit more time, but still, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it can be, it could be difficult. Um, basically after doing it for a while, I've kind of learned, um, I've kind of uh, like, oh, let me think of ex examples um, to explain average temperatures. I love using analogies like fever, right? So I mentioned sometimes people have a hard time understanding, okay, well, the month was four degrees above normal. Doesn't sound like a lot. So I always like to use analogies like fever, right? If you have your body temperature is 98.6 degrees, you add four degrees, all of a sudden you have a fever 102. We understand that very well of like, that's not normal. Yeah, it's only four degrees, but like, you're not feeling well if your fever is at 102 degrees. So mm -hmm. kind of come, like learning by doing it so much, you kind of learn analogies that work, right? So I use that analogy a lot when it comes to average temperature. Mm -hmm. Some of the um, environmental stories that I do, like with the sharks and the algae and things like that, sometimes it is a little bit complicated to explain some of these topics. But overall, I do think that viewers are smarter than we give them credit for. People can have the capacity for understanding these things. And it's funny because when I do interviews with some researchers, they might say, some of them have said to me, 
oh, that's too complicated for you to explain on TV. That's going to be a lot. And I'm like, no, I take that as a challenge. Like <laughs> this information can be digestible. And they laugh and they're like, well, I guess that's your job as the communicator, right? Like I'm literally like a language translator <laughs> between the experts and the public. And I'm kind of filtering the information in between and trying to explain it. I think visuals with TV also helps a lot, you know, being able to use graphics whenever I can, video, um, that really helps too, because something that might be a little bit more difficult, that's maybe a little bit more conceptual. If you show a graphic that tries to explain that, um, you know, maybe like something like the the way the sharks are moving or whatever might be a little bit tough to kind of visualize in your head, but having visual aids also helps as well. So, you know, it's kind of like a case by case, topic by topic basis. Mm -hmm. After doing it for a while, you kind of learn like, well, these are some good analogies for this and these are some good visuals for that. Um, yeah. I think it's fun too, you know? Well, yeah, well, and, and actually, I, I guess I'm going to put you on the spot. I don't quite mean to, but one of the early questions, I'm wondering how, you know, in this that kind of really short snippet time frame, one of the early questions was the, the um, I'm trying to find the phrasing, but like climate change as um, a result of the position of the earth relative to the sun and some of the cycles, you know, that the earth, you know, the ob ob obliqueness of its angle and all of those things that I remember learning about a long time ago um, versus human caused climate change, that anthropogenic climate change that you'd like to avoid. What's your, do you have a, like, how do you distill that? And cause that was a question that came up. And so I'm wondering, do you have a, do you have a good quick analogy based answer for that one? <laughs> about it, how it's human caused. Yeah, what do you think, wh which is it, or is it mostly one or the other when you, that's the question was like, it, do you think climate change is mostly due to those, mm -hmm. the position of the earth versus man-made yeah. changes to our environment? Yeah, um, the science does show that it's like, it is mostly the greenhouse gases that are increasing and that uh, is because of the cars and the planes and the agriculture and a lot of our actions. And there are a lot of um, great graphics for that too. Um, I always explain it as um, the hockey stick scientists kind of that mm -hmm. kind of keys in with us. And the way that I kind of explain that is like, look, and I'll show like, yeah, here, here's your, the natural cycles, right? That some people mm -hmm. will say, Oh no, this is naturally happening. This has happened before carbon has been this high. Um, and then when you, when you go back those thousands of years, here's the, the natural cycle. It kind of, eh, overall, it has a straight line. You had some ups and downs, but it's not really straying too far from this line. Mm -hmm. And then what we find is in the recent years, all of a sudden it looks like a hockey stick. There's just like this steep increase that almost comes out of nowhere because it's very recent. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and scientists literally uh, refer to it as a hockey stick. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I explain it. And it's like, well, when you look at everything else, okay, what has changed since then? Okay, well, this didn't change. The position of the earth didn't change. The chem This didn't change. This didn't change. The one thing that did change um, was the carbon dioxide. And we know from science that's literally was founded in the 1800s. Like this is kind of old, kind of simple science, right? Molecule holds heat. Add more of those molecules, you ha have more heat. So... <laughs> That's kind of how I explain this, those things. I use the hockey stick analogy a lot. Mm -hmm. It sticks with people um, and yeah. yeah, good graphics. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I think that you did a very good job of explaining oh, you. <laughs> in, a, in a very short one minute snippet as I'm sure you've had to do many times. So that yeah. that's great. Um, let me see. Oh, oh, and there's a couple of comments that just came in. They love your fever analogy. In fact, I personally may oh, steal good. that from you. So that's a really you good one. Do. It's <laughs> good to know, like, it's good to get that feedback and know that it works because it might be my favorite analogy, but if nobody gets it, then, mm -hmm. you know, um, oh, no, I, use it's a, great. I use a baseball player too, a baseball player on steroids when people ask like, oh, is this hurricane or whatever particular storm because of climate change? It's a good attribution um, analogy if a baseball player is on steroids, you know, he's going to get more home runs. Do you know if home run number 60 was because of the steroids? Maybe not, but you know that he has the capability of hitting more home runs because he mm. has some external thing that's giving him more fuel. Mm -hmm. so oh, that's that, a great analogy also. That I, 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 that's really good as well. I like I'll that. Keep <laughs> 
<laughs> um, I got there was a really specific question um, also from Will, um, who is really enjoying you telling your story um, and talking about how some of the same conversations about the importance of the stories we're telling in relation to climate, um, how those are starting to be held in the film industry as well, but they're kind of further behind, sounds like the news industry. Um, and do you have, have you had any experience with or how do you view your work intersecting with independent journalism and filmmaking? That's very interesting. Um... Because they are, so what I do on local news is becoming increasingly more common, but there are also a ton of um, talented print journalists that I know that are doing a lot of great um, feature work as well. I know PBS has done some really cool documentaries and stuff that they've asked me to be a part of. Um, I think it's great. Any which way that we can talk about climate change. I know there's even, I've even seen some presentations about art. I even went to a museum and saw some art, an artist that was passionate about painting the melting glaciers. You know, anyway, everyone doesn't take in information in the same way, right? Like I'm a visual person, I'm a conversational person, but you know what? Someone might like the really geeky maps and someone might like the art. Um, so I, yeah, any way that we can um, just start that conversation, um, that's great. Yeah. And um, actually, I've seen a cool artist who actually takes some of the geeky graphs <laughs> and turns them into art. Like the the line of the hockey stick is the glacier in a piece of art. Oh, wow. Really cool. <laughs> I wish I could remember the name of the artist and I don't right now, but it, it's it's really cool. Um, so, um, yeah, just a few minutes left. And I think there's one more question I didn't get to was. <laughs> and this one's kind of a fun one too from Lenny. How do you choose to distill information when making a forecast for the day when there's when weather events in the area are plentiful? How do you choose what to cover? <laughs> That's a great question. So I will choose to focus on the here and now. What's happening today? What's happening tomorrow? And maybe the next day. You will very rarely hear me talk about day seven on mm. the seven day forecast. And that's because there's still some uncertainty with the science. It's going to take a couple of more balloon launches, a couple of more rounds of data on the atmosphere for us to get a little bit more clarity on that. So I'm not going to really stress myself out. And I don't want to confuse you either. If we're worried about today, I'm not going to worry <laughs> you about a week from now. Um, so yeah, and honestly, in the Carolinas, it can get kind of challenging in winter because, you know, the Charlotte area includes the mountains in some of our viewing area. Mm -hmm. In the winter, I feel like I'm doing six different forecasts because you've got like snow and ice in the mountains, temperatures are in the 20s. <laughs> Charlotte's like 65 with sunshine and then forget <laughs> about South Carolina. You know, so it can get challenging to be like, well, I want to serve the whole community. We have to acknowledge that there are people in these mountain counties that are watching us. So that's when I ask for more time on TV. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's good. That's good. I think you deserve it. So <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that. it's as simple as that. Going, I've got too much to talk about today. Please give me another minute because I can't put it all in, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again, Elisa, for joining us today. This has been fascinating and just, I mean... Just so encouraging to hear about the work you're doing in spite of some of the challenges, because of some of the challenges. Yeah. Um, it's just been it's been inspiring. And I think that um, everybody that tuned in has has in the chat indicated the same. So thank you so much for joining us um, next week. Our speaker will be Dr. Rachel Smith, who is the head of the Astronomy and Astrophysics Lab here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. So tune in again next week at 12. As far as I know, Chris will be back. So if you've missed his shining face, he will be here again. Um, but thank you for letting me fill in for these past this week and last week. Um, thank you for joining us from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and the Office of Environmental Education and Public Affairs. We appreciate you being a part of this series of lectures. <laughs>